2,000 years ago, it appeared the forces of darkness had won their ultimate victory. The Son of God was dead. He was buried in a tomb. Those who followed him were in total despair. On Good Friday, the message said from the cross, it's all over. It's finished. They all saw him die. They witnessed the pain and agony he endured. They watched as a soldier pierced his side with a spear. The hope and the promise of the Messiah destroyed. Christ was defeated. Hope had died in the hearts of those around Jesus that Friday afternoon into the early evening. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us what took place Friday evening after six o'clock all the way to Sunday morning. All we know is that they had to take down Jesus' body before 6 p.m. before the Sabbath began. And they had to lay his lifeless body in the tomb. A heavy stone was, was rolled in front of the entrance of that tomb. And then they went home to somehow celebrate Shabbat. We don't know where they went. We don't know what they did. We don't know what they thought. We can only imagine their reality. Their hopes and dreams destroyed. Enemies is won, Jesus was dead, all was lost. I invite you to turn into your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Let's hear the other side of the story. Matthew 28, it's the first book of the New Testament. Verse, chapter 28, verse one, Matthew writes, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now let's put this into context. It was early Sunday morning, and these two women were going to the tomb very early in the morning to finish the job of burying Jesus. You see, there wasn't a sufficient time before the Sabbath was begin on 6 p.m. that night, on Friday night, to properly prepare his body for his sleep of death. Now was the time that they would go to the tomb and they would clean the blood from his body. They would anoint his body. They would be the last ones to touch his face and close his eyes. And in their grief-stricken days, they hadn't even figured out who was gonna roll away the stone. <laughs> There's actually a pretty hilarious line. I, I tell you, the Bible's full of humor. It's just great. A couple verses just before this in chapter 27. If you go to Matthew 27, verse 65, Pilate said to his guards, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. The angel Lord, bless your heart. <laughs> or here in Texas, you might even say, hold my beer. Yeah, I did say that, sorry. Verse two, not sorry. Matthew 28, verse two. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came back and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Like a Marvel movie or one of the adventures, the angel of the Lord descends from heaven, approaches the tomb, rolls back the stone, and takes a seat. <laughs> look at how his appearance looked. Verse three, his appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. I mean, there's, a, there's another Marvel movie coming. There's gotta be. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. I mean, think about it. The guards are so paralyzed, they're shaking in their sandals. They become as dead men, Scripture says. And there's the women walking up to the tomb. They've literally walked through an earthquake to get there. Verse 5. But the angel says to the woman, do not be afraid. 
For I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. And with three short yet incredibly powerful words, the angel reveals the mystery. He has risen. Those three little words announce a new reality that would not only change their lives, but would forever change ours. Verse six, the angel says, he's not here, for he has risen as he said. Come on, come see the place where he lay. And with one swift glance inside that barren tomb, their lives will be instantly and forever changed. They still don't truly grasp what's going on. And the angel tells the ladies, there's no reason to fear. The one you're looking for is not here. He's risen just like he told you. So come on in, check it out. He's not here. He's risen from the dead. Both Mary's been down, they, they, they walk into the tomb. And it was just as the angel said, and all they, all they found were these folded linen cloths. Now, I love what Pastor Randy said this morning in the sunrise service. There is no excuse for any of you kids not to make your bed in the morning. If Jesus can do it on the resurrect from the dead, come on now. <laughs> what was going on in their minds that moment? What were they feeling? Did they just peek in? Did they stick around for a while? Did they touch the linen that had been around his face, his head, his body? Did they stand there in disbelief and fear, anxiety? Did they hug? Did they high five? Did they fist bump? And the angel speaks again in verse seven. The angel says, then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So think about the angel's message so far. Come and see, Jesus isn't here. Now go and tell the others that he's risen from the dead. Verse eight. So they departed quickly from the tomb with dual emotions. Look at this. They depart with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. They hurry off back to Jerusalem with fear and great joy. And then begin verse nine. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. You know, I haven't shared this in a while. It's my favorite Easter story. Kind of was a tradition for me. Maybe I should start it back up again. It's about a third grade Sunday school teacher who asked her kids what were the first words Jesus said when he came out of the tomb. Well, third grade girl waved her hand rapidly in the back. I, I know, I know, I know. He said, what is it, Susie? Susie stood up, raised her hands and said, ta-da! <laughs> well, not quite, but little Susie, she's got it figured out. Look at, look at verse nine. And behold, Jesus met them and said, ta-da! Well, greetings. And they came up and they took up hold of his feet and they worshiped him. Wow. And, and, then, and then Jesus said to them in verse 10a, do not be afraid. Realize this is the second time in this moment that these ladies have been told don't be afraid. Why? Obviously, they're struggling. They're not quite sure. Fear and great joy. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So now there's three commands. Come and see. Go and tell. And don't be afraid. And those two ladies rose from that worship experience with Jesus forever and eternally changed. You see, what we celebrate today is the defining event of the Christian church. 
his shed, shed blood on Calvary's cross and his resurrection on this glorious day means that we can live each day in his forgiveness. The empty tomb means that death can't hold our savior, that we can walk constantly in the newness of life. His presence, his presence means that we can know victory in every situation we face. And his love means we'll never have to face it alone. You see, Easter is a glorious day, a day of celebration, a day of joy. But still remember those, that first Easter weekend, how much they struggled. When they laid Jesus in the tomb, they lived a miserable two days, afraid, hopeless, grief-stricken, alone, frustrated, maybe angry, anxious, withdrawn, maybe even ready to give up. You know, I'm thinking that a lot of us can relate to that. You see that first Easter Friday night and all day Saturday represents in many ways life for a lot of us right now. The reality is, is that we find ourselves in struggles and tragedies and all the garbage of life somewhere between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And we're living in that tension. The crucifixion behind us, but death is still with us. And the final victory lies somewhere in the future and we just can't see the big picture. Now let me see if I can illustrate this concept with for you. Don't put this up yet. But I'm gonna ask you to look at the screen when I tell you. And it's a sentence. And I want you to read it. And I want you to count how many F's are in that sentence. This letter F. How many F's you see in that sentence? All right, put the, put the sentence up, read it. How many F's do you see in that sentence? All right, you got it? Take it down. How many F's did you count? How many counted three? Raise your hand. How many counted four? How many you counted five? How many you counted six? All the folks with three are like, no, that's not true, they're lying. Put it back up there. No catch. Most people forget the ofs in the sentence. They're right in front of you, but they just blend in and they get lost in the sentence. The reality of this day and the hope and the comfort of the resurrection is right in front of our very eyes. But for a variety of reasons, we don't see the big picture. And maybe, maybe it's because we're experiencing the same thing his disciples did that Saturday. That we're afraid, we're hopeless, we're grief stricken. Maybe we feel alone. We're frustrated. Frustrated about what we see on the news and angry about what we hear other people say. Maybe we're anxious because what's happening in our world. And so maybe we're going to withdraw. Maybe some of us are ready to say, I'm ready to give up. But I want you to hear something. Those mourners turned into missionaries. They ran and told the other disciples what they had heard and seen about the risen Christ. And when they did, when they took hold of the reality of the resurrection, when they allowed it to transform them, it did incredible things in their lives. Men who a few days earlier had cowered together in a room, 
afraid of being rounded up, marched out into the world and told everybody about a risen Christ. Women who've been trudging down a weary lane to anoint the body of a slain leader were soon opening up their homes to accommodate hundreds of his followers. Fishermen who wanted nothing to do but go back to their trade of fishing were now preaching all over the countryside and a tent-making rabbi named Saul who intend to stamp out this foolish Christian stuff became the power behind the spread of the gospel from city to city. I want you to think about something. The fact that the Lord revealed himself first to Mary Magdalene, an individual who really had a sordid past, that should shine a ray of hope for every one of us struggling with sin, with guilt, with shame, with fear. If the savior of the world can rescue this insignificant, even possibly demon-possessed woman from her life of sin and choose her to be the first witness of his resurrection, can he not use every one of us and redeem us and save us You see, Easter is about, Easter changes everything. That every day, his shed blood on that cross and his resurrection that glorious day today means that we can live in his forgiveness. The empty tomb means that death can't hold our savior and that we can walk constantly in newness of life. His presence means that we can know victory in every situation we face. And his love says we never have to face it alone. That is, is a message of Easter. No reason to fear. Hope is alive. I was blessed to be a part of a prayer breakfast on Wednesday, a Greater Houston prayer breakfast, and Tim Tebow was speaking. And he said some words, I was just furiously writing them down. And the words that I said, man, that'll preach, and so here they are. He was saying to me, but I'm saying to you. He said, people are starving for hope. The world needs hope. There are people in your office that need hope. There are people in your neighborhood that need hope. There are people here this morning that need hope. Come and see. Go and tell. Don't be afraid. You see, we are those who are carriers of hope, can be then givers of hope. And a final thought, as the disciples were told that Jesus was gonna go ahead of them into Galilee, that they would meet him there, I want you to realize something that Jesus said in John chapter 14. Jesus told those same disciples, he said he's gonna go ahead of them and he said he's gonna go ahead of us and prepare a place for us. And that one day, he will return to take us to be with himself. And then one of the disciples, Thomas, said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And that's when Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I'm your life. I'm gonna invite the band forward. So I want you all to know something. Whatever loss you've experienced, Whatever failure you made, whatever sin you've committed, God can forgive, renew, restore, and rebuild your life. Today, today we celebrate the gift of God's grace that through his son, we have the sure and certain promise that God loves me, that God loves each of you. No matter what I've been, no matter where I've been. And he forgives me for all my mistakes. So I can indeed live with hope, with peace, with joy in a Savior who says to us today, I did this just for you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.